day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the How FirstNet Can Help EMS Provide Better Patient Care webinar. All lines have been placed on a listen-only mode. If you would like to ask a question during the webcast, you may do so by clicking on the Ask a Question button located below the presentation. Simply type your question into the box and hit Send. If at any time you may be experiencing technical difficulties, please use the Ask Question button to send us a message, and we will reply for assistance. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to Noah Smith. Noah, you may begin. Thank you, Gabe, and good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining EMS Focus, a collaborative federal webinar series. My name is Noah Smith, and I am an EMS specialist at the U.S. Department of Transportation, and I'll be your MC for this webinar. Together with our federal partners, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's Office of Emergency Medical Services is focused on advancing a national vision for EMS. The projects we undertake and the resulting resources for the community help plan for system improvements by measuring the health of EMS systems nationwide and delivering the data that EMS leaders need to advance their individual agencies. Another role of the Office of EMS is to educate the EMS community on new innovations, processes, and technologies that can, in the end, help provide better and more efficient patient care. This free webinar series, hosted by the NHTSA Office of EMS, will provide a unique opportunity for federal EMS agencies to share information with the EMS community in a manner that is more personal and less time-consuming than attending conferences, yet still offers the opportunity to interact and ask questions, something that a newsletter or an article simply doesn't allow. We host these webinars every other month about issues that are important to the EMS community and provide you with timely information about what federal agencies are doing to help address those issues. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be archived on our website, www.ems.gov, for future viewing and listening. Moving on to today's topic, how FirstNet can help EMS provide better patient care. First, we will hear from Kevin McGinnis, a FirstNet board member. He will share information about some of the applications and expected benefits of the network for EMS, as well as talk about how EMS has been and continue to be involved in the development of the public safety broadband network. Then we will hear from Amanda Hilliard, Director of Outreach for FirstNet. She will discuss for, uh, current FirstNet outreach, including the state consultation efforts, and explain how EMS communities can get involved. Following the presentation, we'll have time to answer your questions. And just as Gabe said, to submit a question, please click the question button at the bottom of your screen, then type the question into the chat box. We will not be addressing questions during the presentations, but instead we'll address your questions submitted at the Q&A time period following the presentation. If your question is not answered for any reason today, we will provide a follow-up email to you directly, and we'll also provide an email address for additional questions at the end of the webinar. During this webinar, we'll take a look at why the First Responder Network Authority's efforts to build a nationwide public safety broadband network is important to EMS systems across the country. Much conversation has focused on how the network will help first responders and its potential role in major events, such as the Boston Marathon bombing and the Navy Yard shooting. But we can also expect that EMS will see day-to-day -day benefits from the implementation of this network. Although the Office of EMS isn't directly involved in the development process, it's our mission to share information and resources with the EMS community about activities that, uh, at the federal level that may affect your state or your agency. And so with that in mind, and because the FirstNet Board continues to request input from the states and the public safety community, we hope the presentation today provides you with the background information that you need so you may join the conversation and communicate the needs and concerns of your stakeholders, your EMS agencies, to the appropriate contact within your state. Kevin and Amanda, we appreciate you joining us today to talk about how FirstNet is reaching out to EMS and how providers, managers, and state officials can participate in the process. Our first presenter, Kevin McGinnis, started his career in emergency medical services almost 30 years ago and is nationally known and recognized as a supporter and advocate for broadband communications within the EMS community. Kevin is a member of the FirstNet board, and he joins us from Maine. Take it away, Kevin. Thank you, Noah. I hate to say it, but it's really almost been 40 years, and time just flies when you're having fun. And I have had fun, a great career in EMS. Uh, one of the things that I got involved in about 10 years ago 
was uh, public safety communications. It was sort of as though I was the one in the room who didn't step back fast enough when somebody said who would like to represent EMS in public safety communications venues. But um, in that time, I've had um, a good deal of opportunity to learn public safety communications and uh, to be very involved in trying to represent a large EMS community um, here. Six years ago, uh, an amazing thing happened. National organizations that represent fire, law enforcement, and EMS all agreed on something. That is amazing. They agreed that every paramedic, cop, firefighter, should have in their hand on the scene at least the technology that the average 13-year-old enjoys today because we don't have it. Today, Amanda and I will tell you how um, FirstNet is going to accomplish this, how it all came about. Let me give you some EMS examples uh, of what FirstNet will enable. We'll talk a bit about uh, the development status of the network as it stands today and how you can get ready uh, for FirstNet to take advantage of everything it can bring, because FirstNet is going to make a profound change in the way EMS is practiced in the field. It's going to allow us to make better decisions and more and better, with more and better uh, information at our fingertips um, in real time. And I, as I said, I will give you some examples of that. And I predict that EMS over fire and law enforcement will be the biggest uh, user of FirstNet uh, in the coming years. So as folks know, um, we had a sea change uh, in ambulance service in the late 60s and early 70s. We went from essentially being a horizontal taxi cab service to a sophisticated modern uh, mobile medical uh, service uh, that can save lives and bring tremendous capabilities to patients at the scene of their illness or injury. One thing that did not change um, from the early 1970s when modern EMS really was born um, to today, today um, is the way we communicate. By and large, the same um, land mobile radio, VHF, UHF uh, systems that we used in the early 70s are what we're using today. And uh, even though some of us have gone to 700 and 800 megahertz systems and we use cell phones a lot more, by and large, those narrow band, and I'll talk about what narrow band means later, um, systems are not going to support us into the future. There have been a number of studies that have indicated that we need to move beyond the communication system of today. And in the last 10 years, I've held multiple uh, focus groups and expert panels to try and help me understand what the needed technology in the field is going to be in the next 10 or 15 years so that I can go out and put the two sets forth in at the planning tables for the kinds of resources, infrastructure, bandwidth, and other resources that EMS is going to need to support that technology. Um, and today, what I will do is, out of all of those interactions with EMS medical directors and chiefs and medics and EMTs and others, um, telling us what kinds of technology we need. Um, I will provide some examples. This is not all coming out of my head by any stretch. Um, however, um, let me give you just a little slice of what that, that world is going to look like, and we'll push out our first video. Woods, you've been in an accident. Do you understand me? 
Given the nature of your injuries, we'd like you to speak to a specialist on video. Is that all right? I'm Dr. Greer. There are a few questions I'd like to ask you. Given the video has concluded, you may proceed. At that point, successfully, I wasn't able to see it on my screen. <laughs> so, that's just a taste of what um, we may have in store for us in the future. Uh, the exact technologies may be different, um, but it certainly is quite a bit different than what we have today. Those focus groups and expert panels um, produced four overall uh, conclusions um, uh, of needs that we have in EMS uh, coming, to, coming to the future. The first is a need for situational awareness. That is to say, and this is something that's well known in emergency management, law enforcement, but virtually unknown in EMS, that simply is that we have a perfect knowledge of the resources that we have to bring to bear on our next call for a patient we're going to next encounter. Uh, whether it's a uh, trauma center or a helicopter, extrication unit, or additional ambulances or crew. We know where they all are at any time in real time. And we also know all of the events going on around us, whether there are other EMS calls going on, anything that will take resources away from our current needs and our patients' current needs. The second is common operating picture. EMS, by its nature, is a team sport more so than law enforcement or firefighting. Um, every call that we have involves more than one uh, player, one responder. It involves an EMS medical director online uh, or offline um, with us. It involves at least a crew of two, if not first responders, and other responders coming to the scene, perhaps in a helicopter. Um, and it's important that they all have their own situa situational awareness, but also that um, at any given moment that the whole team whether they're in the hospital or in the field, <clears throat> has a common expectation for what's going to happen to that patient in the next 5, 15, or 30 minutes. Um, next, that we need to move from a world of uh, where we're wandering our way through calls by sequentially processing information. That is, the tone goes off, we get a location and uh, idea of what the call is about, and then in the next couple of minutes, we may learn something more about the location or the condition of the patient or patients, and we revise our picture of what's happening out there. And we do this throughout the call, getting pieces of information and revising our picture of what we're going to encounter and what we're going to need. We need to get to a, a point where we're parallel processing information, um, where we have all of the information that we need uh, to manage that call well um, at our fingertips, uh, not pouring into our heads or our ears or our eyes at the same time, but at a place or in places where we know where we can get uh, to them. And finally, we need to have the ability to adopt um, technologies, whether it's diagnostic or treatment technologies, that are available today that we don't have um, the ability to do because we don't have the communications to support those. In order to get to that place and realize situational awareness and common operating picture, et cetera, um, we need to have a network of databases out there that list, uh, that has the status of those resources that we need to know about, whether it's hospital status or air medical status, et cetera, and the status of other events going on around us, something that we can reach out to and access the information in that database that has been updated in real time. It's updated as of a minute ago, not an hour ago. And uh, we need to have adequate bandwidth to be able to use some technology that we can't use today and to uh, actually exchange data um, as we want. And we got to learn a new way of operating. Um, voice communications need to be uh, treated as what they are, which is a bottleneck, not a facilitation. The ability of a um, paramedic, in, a busy paramedic in the field to talk to a busy emergency room doctor uh, and have a conversation about a patient and what needs to be done um, uh, is a window of time that doesn't happen uh, as easily as it used to. And so 
it's important that we be able to take data that we have at our fingertips, push it out and park it in the database, so when our doctor is then available, they can go out and grab it, pull it in from that database, consume it, and then push the data out to me, the paramedic in the field, who, when I have a spare moment, can then go access that database and pull the information back into myself. Um, and then finally, uh, to access those databases, we need to have interfaces um, that, are, that work for paramedics, that work for doctors, uh, whether it's a PDA, uh, whether that's a smartphone, um, a mobile data unit in the ambulance or a desktop uh, PC in the emergency department. We need some way to uh, look at these databases. And because we're visual people, it might look something like this in front of you, a picture depicting the response area of Ridgeway EMS-1 ambulance um, with critical information immediately available on the screen, like the status of hospitals, the status of air medical, uh, and then each one of those data um, points or icons uh, can be clicked on and drilled down so that you can see that Ridgeway EMS has a crew of McGinnis and Smith um, and that one's a paramedic and one's an EMT. You can see the status of the volunteer ambulance next door at the hospital and, and the trauma center. Um, you can check click in the lower left-hand corner on the inventory um, of the ambulance. And if you can picture walking into an EMS base today, in order to uh, check out the rigs and get the information that's portrayed on this screen, it takes a better part of an hour inventorying two ambulances, let's say, um, calling the hospital to find out their status, the air medical system to find out its status, et cetera. It's a lofty piece of work um, when instead you can click onto this screen and suddenly all of this information is consumable by you in five minutes and you're ready to go this call. So let's talk about uh, uh, some examples. And I know people will cringe when they see the word the golden hour, and this is mostly used for public consumption, but let's talk about time-dependent conditions and, let's say, trauma. Um, whether it's an hour or it's 15 minutes, um, there are certain things that are just truth, and those are that in time-dependent conditions like trauma, um, we don't have a lot of time. And when you take, you define um, the start of that clock running as the moment that uh, the event happens that creates an injury in you that will kill you, ultimately, to the point where a surgeon, the last, very last moment where a surgeon can actually fix that injury so that you don't die. Um, it's probably not two minutes. Uh, it's probably not two hours, but somewhere in between. And what we do know is if that event is a car crash, we probably don't have, as is the case today, 20 minutes um, for that car crash to be discovered and reported and the 911 system to be activated in a rural area, 20 minutes for me to get in my ambulance and go out to the scene or 30 minutes or whatever it takes in a rural area response, to go out to that scene and discover that the patient really is um, going to die if we don't do something, the 15 minutes to get the helicopter up, out, and to the scene, and 40 minutes back to the trauma center, um, that's time that you probably just don't have. Now, fast forward to the first net world. Um, instead, when that car crashes, a pulse of data is sent by OnStar, ATX, or other systems uh, in an automatic crash notification alert. Um, that data could go straight to a public safety answering point um, or, and then be reprocessed, retransmitted onto our smartphone. So when the call comes in, um, immediately, within a minute, not 20 minutes later, we know we have a crash. We know where it is. We know how bad it is. We know what kinds of forces acted on the car. Um, and uh, generally likely condition with patients. That just saves us 20 minutes out of call it whatever you want, but the time-dependent condition. With advanced automatic crash notification, um, you'll see in the upper left-hand corner, we can program into the system the ability to take the data coming out of the car and give us a, a probability of a severe injury, in this case 92%. 
Think about what that allows us to do in the future um, in terms of planning for crashes. The local air medical system can say um, that automatically, if we have a certain percentage likelihood of injury, that they'll put the crew in the helicopter. Another percentage that they'll turn the helicopter on, another one that they'll launch and head to the scene. The same thing for extrication services uh, or additional resources. Um, and then we don't have to wait for Kevin to get to the scene to determine it's the bad one. And we just saved, what, 20 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour? out of that time of dependent condition. But the ability to take the data from that car, send it to a processing point, and then get it onto my smartphone requires um, a fairly large data pipe. Another benefit in that crash um, from that data goes to the folks coming out to do extrication. Um, Just-in-time learning can be uh, facilitated by having that data on the, the screen of the smartphone of one of the responders and bringing up um, the instructions for that particular make and model of car on where to cut and not to cut to best get the patient out of that vehicle. So what we've just done is parallel process a whole bunch of information um, on the smartphone screen uh, or the mobile data unit in the ambulance. This is what we can have as we roll out of the ambulance um, instead of um, not knowing and wondering our way through the call. We know when all of the responders that are involved in the team are going to get there. Gives us a common operating picture of what we're going to see uh, from the data pulse in the car. Um, and so everybody knows what everybody's doing, and we know what the patient's condition is. Um, quite a bit of change, and that's something that is our future. Then when we get on the scene, if you think about what happens when you get out of the ambulance, and go to see your first patient at the scene of the car crash, it's probably a six to ten minute process to approach, make sure it seems safe, uh, establish contact with the patient, uh, gather information from the patient, do some immediate care, call the hospital, have a conversation, decide with the patient, start with the half of the patient, um, and so forth, and then move on to the next patient if it's not being treated by multiple folks. So instead, let's look at the future of FirstNet. Instead, I hop out of the ambulance, I turn on a video cam, Google Glass or what have you, uh, on my, my helmet, um, and start transmitting a live picture of the scene and the damage done to the car and eventually the patient into patient database number one. I turn on a throat mic and start dictating a note, which is uh, voice-to-text translated into a Word document or other file and put it put in uh, patient database number two. I come up to the car and I take a device, picture the tricorder for you Star Trek fan, and flash it in front of the patient, and I get uh, standard up vital signs indicating the patient is alive and we should continue proceeding to treat the patient. So we put a small uh, playing deck car, uh, playing card deck size uh, monitor on the patient's chest. We start sending out uh, multiple vital signs in the patient database number three, and we connect with either a device on the patient's uh, a USB dongle that the patient wears around their neck, um, or we get a number from them, an ID number, which allows us access into the health information exchange network, and we download the medical record so that we know uh, what their history is, a uh, significant history is. And that goes into patient database number four, and it all looks something like this. Please push out the second video. Okay, start record. We have a passenger truck, one what appears to be one driver, vehicle is on wheels, moderate damage to front, appears to have been in frontal collision. Stop record. Excuse me, sir, can you hear me? Excuse me, sir, can you hear me? Okay, I have a positive radial pulse and I have an unconscious patient. I ha start record. We have what appears to be a large laceration to the right forehead and right face, bleeding down the neck into the, onto the chest area. No obvious major deformity to the chest, abdomen, or lower extremities. <sighs> Sir, can you hear me? <sighs> can you hear me? Can you open your eyes? Okay. <sighs> Patient's responsive to pain only, does not answer questions. We're gonna be transmitting vital signs right now. Okay, I have a medical history tag, and I'm gonna submit it for transmission. Medical history being transmitted now. 
Okay, let's move on to the next page. Well, thank you. What we just saw um, was the populating of those four databases in a matter of 60 seconds. In 60 seconds, those databases are now accessible to the physician in the emergency department, the incoming air medical crew, uh, for, for use without having to uh, interact with the medic on the scene at all, at least initially. 60 seconds instead of 6 to 10 minutes. Imagine the, the, the efficiency that that will produce for us. Some other applications that we might um, encounter in the future, two-way video, um, particularly important in rural settings, um, also in community paramedicine settings, uh, which is a new um, um, forthcoming um, practice within EMS. Uh, the ability to guide a patient uh, in the field or guide a, uh, an EMT in the field on the way in in a 90-minute um, transport to the big city uh, at a time when a helicopter couldn't fly and the patient basically uh, stable when they leave the hospital, but suddenly 20 minutes in, turns a color that the EMT has never seen before. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to have a virtual doctor there? Portable ultrasound, another um, good example of technology. Portable ultrasound is used today in helicopters and ambulances, but it's generally interpreted by folks who use it often enough uh, and because they're seeing the sickest of the sick every day to be able to interpret it. But wouldn't it be nice, again, when you have that car crash in the rural area, um, to have uh, an EMT uh, be able to wand the patient's abdomen and, you know, based on whether there's blood where blood shouldn't be or there's not, the decision is made to call the helicopter and send the patient to the trauma center or to go to the local hospital. In either case, whether the life-saving um, solution is chosen, um, or the local hospital solution is chosen. It's a right solution for the patient for the healthcare system in terms of savings of resources that otherwise might not have been needed. Picture being able to monitor 20 patients at the same time of a mass casualty incident by putting a moat device like the one seen in the right here on 20 patients and then monitoring their condition, um, getting better or getting worse and sending uh, perhaps scarce uh, um, EMS personnel to patients who seem to be having problems. Uh, you can also use the same kind of technology in monitoring uh, firefighters at a fire scene for those that are responsible for overseeing um, responder condition. And I would just say at this point that of those other of the predicted technologies that are going to require um, special communications, uh, we have three or four dozen, and I refer you to the National Public Safety Telecommunications Council EMS Committee uh, report um, that has over three dozen different technologies recommended to be supported by FirstNet. Uh, you can find NIPSTIC on the, on the web. But one thing I'll tell you, everything I've just described, our communication system of today won't support. Nothing, none of it. The reason for that is the pipe that we use, the narrow-band pipe we use for VHF, UHF, 700, 800 cell phones um, is so small that the only data that it will transmit data at the speed of 20-year-old dial-up. So picture dial-up today. That's six times faster than old dial-up. And picture trying to download something on dial-up uh, dial Internet access. We, we need to have something different. So, as I said, in about 2006, uh, we realized the need to have a national public safety, nationwide public safety broadband network dedicated to public safety. And national EMS organizations, fire organizations, police and public safety communications organizations got together and put on a five-year campaign on Capitol Hill um, and with the administration, and in 2012, um, a law was passed which created FirstNet. It brought with it. It brought with it um, uh, the network um, LTE technology, which is a chosen technology, uh, 4G technology, um, some spectrum in beachfront area, 
which is very useful or spectrum for us. Uh, it brought us $7 billion to begin um, building the system and a direction that ultimately uh, the system needs to be self-funded through fees. But the board uh, of FirstNet also recognizes that um, in the future that system is going to have to be saleable to every EMS chief out there who has to make a decision of whether to uh, renew the capabilities they have today or go to the first net capabilities. But ultimately what we're going to end up with is an AT&T or Verizon, if you will, of uh, full public safety alone. And the vision that we have uh, is like this. Um, Today, um, we have uh, data and voice communications primarily through commercial wireless. There are a lot of email services out there that use data, um, that send data, send patient run records back to the base for aggregation and that sort of thing. Um, but none of those communications are mission critical, patient critical communications, and they shouldn't be because commercial wireless is simply not reliable enough or public safety grade enough um, to start basing our uh, patient operations on their use. We, we use for mission critical communications today is still land mobile radio, the, the VHF and VHF radios I described. They are reliable enough. In the near term, um, it's going to change a bit. With FirstNet, we will have mission critical capable data communications. That's the primary function of LTE technology that we're using. Um, and it's for doing the types of things I just described. For the time being, however, voice communications, mission critical voice communications, will still need to be had done over land mobile radio. So while LTE does support voice, if you have one of those early devices today, you'll know um, that they are not particularly reliable. But in the long term, certainly the goal is to have over the first net network uh, combined voice and data um, capabilities. And so that is our future. So what can you do to get involved in FirstNet and its development? First of all, every state has a single point of contact for the development of FirstNet. They've been named by the governor. Get to know who that person is. Every one of those has developed a committee of some sort, which is supposed to be a representative committee of public safety, uh, including EMS and hospitals, uh, to help in the development and the integration of FirstNet into that state. Find out where that table is, get to the table, uh, and, um, and speak for EMS. Make sure that there's somebody there doing that. Um, you're going to need to determine what kinds of technologies you want in your area in the future. Is it the ones I described, or is there other ones that Mystic has uh, described in their white paper? Um, follow, um, follow FirstNet on the web. And uh, Amanda is going to start um, now, and she will describe um, the specific websites that you can go to later on to do all of this. Amanda? Great. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, thanks, everyone, for, for joining us. So what I'm going to do um, for the, the rest of the presentation is give you a brief update on the past activities within FirstNet over the last year and um, highlight some of our key activities that we're working on right now. Our top two priorities right now are consultation with the, the public safety community across all disciplines, all levels of government, as well as our acquisition to make this network a reality. Uh, last March, our, our board released a roadmap um, with some of our, our key milestones for the coming year. I'm, I'm pleased to announce that we met um, three of those major milestones. And this snapshot here, which I'm going to build on in my briefing, um, shows you some of the, the major next steps that we have coming up, which I'll build on here. So absolutely critical to our success is to get significant input um, and engage the public safety community. And we have a number of, of different ways that we are, are doing that. Uh, one, through our public comment process, um, and in that process, we had our first public notice that we released back in September. Um, we got 66 responses, and, and this is a way where we get some input on, on key topics. So for the first one, uh, we asked for feedback on our definition of public safety entity, who we, in, 
vision being eligible users for the network. We also um, asked for some feedback around our definition of rural. As you may know, uh, FirstNet is required to have some rural uh, milestones within each phase of the network, um, so we wanted to ask some questions around that. Regarding our acquisition process, uh, we released a number of requests for information over the last uh, year and a half or two years, um, some very specific on devices, applications, um, and most recently in September of this past year, we issued a comprehensive request for information in which we laid out some high-level statement of objectives for our, our procurement and essentially asked uh, for feedback on that from industry in terms of what industry may be able to provide um, for our effort and from the public safety community in, in terms of what does public safety expect. Um, we know that Kevin had mentioned the $7 billion that we have for this effort. We know that that's, that's not going to be enough, so it's, it's very critical that we find a partner or partners um, to engage with us um, to help build the network, operate it, and maintain it. So where we're at right now with our acquisition, we got a lot of great response from that latest RFI. We had 122 responses that we're, we're working through, and we are uh, working to release a draft comprehensive network um, proposal um, in the near future for, for feedback before ultimately issue, issuing a final RFP. Our outreach engagements, what we're doing here um, today, we, we spend a lot of time um, talking within the, the states. Uh, each state has some, some grant funding um, to help do outreach on FirstNet, so we support those efforts. We're very engaged with many of the national public safety associations. Uh, really just in this way, we're focusing on our education and awareness of FirstNet. Um, the Act required us to create a Public Safety Advisory Committee, which was one of the first actions that the, the Board took upon being stood up. Um, there's 40 members of, of the PSAC, including on the EMS side, the National Association of EMS Officials, the National Association of EMTs, and the National EMS Management Association. Um, and we engage with this group regularly. They have a few uh, tasks right now that they're um, going to be starting to to have some dialogue and provide us some feedback in particular uh, very soon on priority and preemption and public safety grade. So that's been a, a great forum um, for us to, to get some really good input from the public safety community. And then the last area which I'm going to spend the next couple of minutes talking about is our, our state consultation efforts. You see here on the, the slide, the Act specifically calls out a, a number of topics that we have to engage with each state, each state and territory on, um, construction of the radio access network, um, assignment of priority to local users, training needs. And uh, we have, have formally launched our consultation pro process with all 56 states and territories, and we do this through that state single point of contact or SPOC. Uh, that Kevin had mentioned. On the federal side, we are also um, working to do a similar consultation process with the, the federal departments and agencies as um, they will also be, uh, the public safety community will be users of this network. So this next slide here, I, the Act requires FirstNet to develop a state plan for each of the 56 states and territories, that, that red box there on the slide, uh, which will essentially be presented to the governor to make an, an opt-in or opt-out decision uh, within 90 days. So if the governor uh, receives the plan, and, and the plan is for how FirstNet would build the radio access network um, within the state, the governor can opt in, and in that case, uh, FirstNet would proceed forward with um, the responsibility for um, owning or for um, building, maintaining, and operating the network. Um, if the state decides to opt out, and there's a, a detailed process for that that I won't get into, but if the, the state successfully opts out, um, the state is essentially taking onus and, and responsibility, financial responsibility for um, building, operating, and maintaining the radio access network portion. Uh, regardless of the opt-in or opt-out decision, the, the RAN will connect to the FirstNet core, so again, it's, it's a single nationwide network. So what this slide shows here is essentially the processes, some of the activities that are, are taking place to get to this state plan, and you can see we're, we're fairly early um, in this process. There's a, we have to get through an acquisition, as you can see. We need to have uh, results from that comprehensive RFP that I, I briefly talked about. That's where we'll get some of the cost information, some of the design information. Um, essentially, that's all needed before we can ultimately deliver the state plan um, for how the, the radio access network um, would be built within the state. 
You can also see um, some of the, with the arrows, how the consultation process that we're engaging in now is informing our RFP process. Um, and essentially the, the last point I wanted to make is that this um, consultation effort will continue well after the state plan. So we envision we would continue to engage with the states and, and the local community within the state as we start to build out and, and ultimately grow the network. The next slide here gives you a snapshot of where we are with each state and territory in terms of our um, initial consultation, which again, um, we are coordinating through that state single point of contact. Uh, back in April of last year, we released an initial consultation package to all 56 states and territories and requested some documentation uh, regarding you know, governing bodies, outreach that has been done around FirstNet, um, you know, current use of, of mobile data, things like that. And as you can see here, 46 of the 56 states and territories have uh, provided a response back to FirstNet with some of that information that that we are using to then go and, and have an engaging uh, initial consultation meeting. Our goal is to meet with all 56 states and territories um, by the end of the, the year. We have 13 that are complete so far and, and we're uh, working very hard and, and have meetings scheduled almost every week for the next several months to again get to all 56 states and territories. Um, if, if any of you reside within the 10, 10 states or territories that we haven't yet um, received a package back, I would just note we're in regular contact with, with all 56 states and territories. So um, we know that many of those will be coming very soon. Let me talk for just a few minutes about what this first initial consultation meeting um, entails. Um, the agenda for the day or some of the goals that we have uh, first and foremost to strengthen our relationship with, with the state and, and the local public safety community. Um, second, to provide FirstNet updates. We spend a bit of time um, kind of catching up, making sure that everybody in the room is on the same page of, of the program and, and sort of where we're at right now. Uh, spend a lot of time answering questions. The third part is around learning about the state's unique needs, and this is um, the place in the agenda where some of the public safety, local public safety folks come up and essentially provide a presentation about maybe an incident um, that they responded to or a planned event, how broadband is being used today, how it might, how it's working, um, or if it's, if it's not, how they would envision using it in the future. And that's been, we've received some really good use cases and input that we're uh, working to incorporate into our RFP process. And then the second half of the day, um, we spend uh, discussing users and, and coverage um, and some next steps. So the next slide here kind of shows you that afternoon discussion that we have. Um, we take some time uh, with the participants in the room talking about um, the process that FirstNet has established for um, determining some baseline coverage objectives for each state and territory. Um, essentially, we're looking at, you know, where do public safety um, responders reside, some of the critical infrastructure, highways, things like that. So again, just establishing a baseline of coverage objectives for the state. And then essentially the next step is for that SPOC to go out and engage with the community across the state, all disciplines, to really validate and, and add to those objectives. What are some unique things about that state or territory um, that we didn't cover in the baseline that are absolutely critical for this network? The second part is um, wanting to understand a little bit more about users. Uh, we have some, some general numbers from census and, and other data sources on the number of public safety officials, um, but really wanting to work with the SPOCs to validate and update some of those numbers. Also begin to understand for those that are currently using mobile broadband today, um, what kind of usage and, and data consumption. Um, so the SPOCs is, will likely um, should start collecting a lot of this data, having discussions within the state around coverage and, and capacity and users. Um, so I would just encourage you, um, you'll probably be hearing more about this in the next couple of months from your state single point of contact, and I would just ask for you to, to get involved with that process. We have um, some general information from, from some sources, but the more um, data and the more specifics we can gather from the community, um, the better we'll be able to really build this network to meet your needs. The last part I just wanted to, to touch on, um, I mentioned this a little bit with the state plan, is, is the main components of the, the network being the core, uh, the radio access network, 
and our devices and, and services and where there will be choices. So for the um, core network, I mentioned this is a, a first net responsibility. It's a, a single nationwide network. Um, regardless of that opt-in or opt-out decision, FirstNet um, owns responsibility for that core network, kind of the brains behind the network. In terms of the radio access network, I had mentioned um, a plan will be delivered to the governor for how FirstNet um, envisions implementing the network within the state. Um, if the state chooses to opt-in, FirstNet will, again, take responsibility, all costs, um, for building out, maintaining, operating that network. If a state successfully opts out, the state is taking on that responsibility. And then last in the area of, of devices and services, and this is completely um, an agency's choice. Um, is, you know, no one is required to, to use this network. Our, our goal is that, um, you know, after we get all this input and, and work through our acquisition, the state planning process, get the network rolled out, that, that people will be very eager and anxious to, to sign up. So again, this, the, the devices that we would offer, the services that we offer, that would be up to an agency to decide what to, to purchase. So lastly, Kevin had mentioned, you know, how, how can you get involved? Um, I have a few more links here on my page. I would encourage you, if you're not familiar with your state single point of contact, to get to know him or her. Um, the, the contact list is on our website at that firstnet.gov consultation page. Uh, we also have a list of the Public Safety Advisory Committee members, um, another great way to, to get involved. Um, stay in touch. Keep an eye. We will, have, uh, we will be releasing our draft RFP, future public notices. Um, I would just encourage you, if you're, you're interested, our, our website has a lot of great information. Um, we're often putting blogs out there. Um, and, and there's a lot of different ways to participate. But I would say if you do anything, the, the most important thing is, is to get to know that state single point of contact. We are also very active on, on social media, and you can see some of the, our Twitter handle and some of the other links there. So with that, I will turn it back over to Noah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda. We really appreciate you and Kevin taking the time to go through all of this with us today. And now uh, we'll have you answer some questions from the audience. A quick reminder about how to submit a question. Please click the question button at the bottom of the screen and then type the question into the chat box. Uh, I will read the questions for Kevin and Amanda to address. And we've got about 10 minutes left, and so we'll see how many of these we can get through. Uh, the first question uh, is from the state of Arizona, and the question is, how will FirstNet address insufficient broadband access or communication infrastructure, particularly in rural areas? Maybe Amanda? Yep, sure, so I can take a stab at this. Um, as I had mentioned, the, the act that, that um, stood up FirstNet requires us to um, have milestones in each phase of our, our build to, to reach the rural community. So that's a, um, a major goal that we have, and essentially we will be working through that consultation process that I just mentioned, um, working with each state and territory to understand um, where there are current gaps in coverage and how we might work together to, to fill those gaps. Um, as we roll out the network over time. So again, that, that consultation process um, and getting to know your SPOC and making sure that your, your SPOC understands um, some of the challenges today is, is probably the best way to, to get involved and communicate those needs. I would just I would add, um, you know, in terms of specific technology, and technology is changing all the time, so what we say today may not apply next year. But we've always known that we're going to have a core backbone system, which is a terrestrial system with cell towers and the sorts of things you, you associate with uh, cellular communications or smartphone communications. But we would also have backups of satellite uh, communications, much better and less expensive than they have been in the past. And then finally, deployables um, that we are experimenting with in some areas, uh, which would not only bring a capacity in a large emergency, but could bring um, uh, expanded broadband capabilities to places that have a huge number of people uh, at that place for a short period of time for concerts or, you know, large-scale events, and then the people disappear. So those are some, some of the ways that we could see doing that. Thank you both. 
Our next question uh, is on treatment guidelines and SOPs for agencies. So EMS and fire agencies will likely need to develop treatment guidelines and standard operating procedures for using FirstNet technology uh, to ensure that the, that the device or the application that's being used uh, will, will be efficient and safe. Um, will FirstNet develop treatment guidelines or SOPs for agencies to adopt or modify for their own use? That's a great question, um, and I can say that the answer um, has not gelled quite yet. Um, there will be uh, a good deal of those types of decisions um, will uh, evolve as best practices uh, or application, uh, as an example, that may run over the network. And we certainly will maintain uh, an app store or something of that nature so that uh, applications that are found to be useful um, uh, can be easily accessed. Um, but actually, the you know, SOPs uh, for using the system, um, decisions about you know, if we're using video a lot in a given EMS system, under what circumstances do we have to throttle that video or turn it down or turn it off so that in an emergency situation we can have other types of data flowing or voice flowing? Um, so those kinds of decisions, for the most part, will be as uh, treatment protocols are today, a local, regional, or state um, decision that have to be um, uh, determined by the folks around the table at the local, regional, or state level. And um, guided, yes, by national best practices that may come out of FirstNet um, uh, or be developed through applications. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, we have several questions coming in about cost, as is easily anticipated. Um, one, of the, one of the questions is uh, about how EMS agencies today, uh, particularly in, in rural areas, but in urban areas as well, do struggle a lot with the cost of buying and maintaining technology. And so if FirstNet is uh, to be sustained by, by user fees, how do you project to address uh, agencies that might not have the funding to purchase and support even basic technology today being able to support FirstNet technologies in the future. Amanda? So I can start. Um, so, yes, one of the ways we will be funded is through fees, but the other piece I didn't mention is that we have the ability to um, essentially sell off our excess capacity. So Kevin mentioned that beachfront spectrum that we have for this network. Um, on the average day, we don't think public safety will need that full um, bandwidth all the time, so we have the ability to essentially partner um, with a, what we're calling a secondary user and, and um, bring in revenue for the network uh, by leasing off that excess capacity. So that's one way that, um, you know, in addition to the fees that we collect it, that we hope we'll be able to um, keep uh, the service fees fairly low and, and the devices fee um, and, and competitive with with the commercial entities today. Now, Kevin, if you would like to add anything more to that. Well, I would just say that, yeah, EMS, like fire, volunteer fire, um, uh, have limitations on what they can afford and oftentimes have to have dinners and bake sales to support that. And yet, um, show me an ambulance that doesn't have a cell phone. Um, you know, few and far between. So the, the decision that's going to have to be made down the road by that EMS chief, whether it's a volunteer EMS chief or uh, a large service EMS chief that has to put technology in 40 ambulances, um, they're going to evaluate whether they keep the cell phone they've got or smartphone they've got in those ambulances now or adopt a FirstNet device. And the first that board knows and staff knows that that's got to be an economical decision. Um, so that's what's certainly driving our work, and we will only be successful if we can offer something that offers value, uh, offers um, capabilities that don't now exist, and we know that will be the case, um, but also has to be economical, and that's the challenge for us. 
Thank you, Kevin. And and speaking of value, uh, there's a question that came in uh, that speaks to a particular uh, need that this community has, and that is that a significant part of this uh, community's responsibility is to transport patients from hospital to hospital. Will there be a way to move patient information or patient orders from the uh, from the first hospital to EMS devices and to transfer that information to the receiving hospital under the uh, under the network that we're talking about today? I think absolutely. Um, one of the goals is not only doing that, but being able to. Um, in the field, by the time the patient, you know, I talk about populating four patient databases uh, in that car crash example. Well, the next step of that, once the patients are taken care of, is that that's all integrated into one health record. Um, and that that health record, with all of the four patient databases um, or pieces thereof, or uh, web links to, like, the video, for instance, um, in that patient database, will all go and be at the hospital before the ambulance gets there, um, perhaps without any contact, voice contact, between the medic and the uh, hospital staff. Well, if you can do that, then certainly the goal is to be able to um, do interfacility transports in the same manner, that you're able, instead of picking up an envelope of the patient's, uh, all of the patient's information and physically carrying it with you to the next hospital, that you will be able to have the patient's information on your computer before you even see the patient uh, or your smartphone or, or whatever, uh, and that you'll carry that to the hospital and at the other end be able to automatically download that through Bluetooth or some other capability. And in fact, that capability is already in many states today that have health information exchanges. Um, once you know that you're going to pick up Mrs. Jones um, at the hospital to go to a new hospital, you can go into the health information exchange and get a record down before you ever step foot in the, the first hospital. That's great. Thank you so much, Kevin. And for our final question, I'll ask a, a very important one, um, which is uh, about privacy and security of the information that's being transmitted across the network. What security protocols do you anticipate will be in place to assure the privacy of patients and uh, the agencies using the network? Well, I can tell you that we anticipate that the FirstNet network will probably be um, one of the prime targets of um, uh, communications hackers and um, others who would want to bring a system down because of the people that it's serving, um, you know, public safety. So uh, security uh, is absolutely, cybersecurity is absolutely job one um, as far as the network's um, uh, capabilities are, are concerned. Uh, and they far, far outstrip um, any requirements that HIPAA may have uh, or that uh, patients would want to make sure that the system has. So um, you know, that would be my, my quick answer. Amanda? Sure, yeah, I think that's that's a great answer, and that's um, definitely a, a topic in one of our that we covered and asked a lot of questions about in our request for information. It's also um, folded into that 15 statement of objectives that we'll be including in our RFP. And I can also say our I know our CTO, our chief technical team, um, is is in the process of hiring um, a cybersecurity lead. So. As Kevin mentioned, absolutely critical and, and a high priority for this network. Absolutely. And thank you both so much uh, for the answers to those questions. Um, with the time expiring, this will conclude today's installment of EMS Focus. I'd like to thank uh, all of our presenters, Kevin and Amanda from FirstNet, and thank those of you who have tuned in for participating in today's webinar. Today's webinar is being recorded and will soon be archived on EMS.gov for future viewing and listening. And as a reminder, for those of you who submitted questions but we were not able to answer them in time, we will send you personally responses to those questions. Our next webinar is scheduled for April of this year. And for information about future webinars and to subscribe to receive information about the EMS Focus webinar series, please visit EMS.gov and click Email Updates on the top right. Thank you again, and have a great rest of your week.